Now, something new for you, ladies and gentlemen. During the first UK lockdown, the search terms new hobbies actually increased by 110% online with Betterly and Beardwatch, I'm encouraging you to spend free time offline. I know as well as anyone else that it's actually really easy just to get sucked in, sitting there in your free time, just scrolling through social media endlessly to no avail. What I want to do and what Betterly want to do with Beardwatch is encourage you guys to spend your free time more productively and learn a new skill and get into something. With a Betterly subscription, you actually get a new Beardwatch box every single month and each box contains something different each time. There are 12 in the series and each comes every single month. With each box you receive one collector's booklet, one card describing the products and their use, three beard care products or two beard care products and one tool. Each box is numbered as well and in this box I've got beard shampoo, I've got beard oil and I've also got a razor as well. You will also see as well, you've got styles and stories of male grooming here with loads of info on how to style your beard and get on with it. And I know what you're saying at the moment, my beard is not how it used to be. It used to be absolutely enormous and it may well be coming back for this winter. I don't want a cold face, so I may well grow back that aggressive beard. Some of you know from 2017, 2018 maybe. Hello. So that may well be making a return and Beardwatch will be helping me through that. Box two then, over here. In here we've got beard conditioner, we've got beard balm, and also a brush here. And yet again, you get a whole new booklet as well to go through, which gives you things like beauty tips, skin tips, interviews with expert barbers, and you even got advice in there, how to style your beard for your particular face shape, especially useful for people like me that have a head shaped like a baked bean. So now then the offer, hit the link below, start your Betterly journey today and with that specific link and code you'll get 20% off. That is in the pinned comment and also in the description. As always, every single click supports the channel and you'll also be embarking on an epic journey. For now then, let's get back on with the video. Welcome back to a rather gloomy day here on TGTV. You join me with a very interesting and unusual car. This is a car that not many people know much about. This is a car that you drive around in and people constantly stop and ask you what it is. They stare at it and it's certainly a very, very interesting proposition. We of course got the Polestar 1 behind me. We'll go into a little bit of background about the Polestar 1. Uh, you may well have seen recently that I tested the Polestar 2 on the channel, a fully electric vehicle from a Polestar. However, this is a different kettle of fish, so we're going to get into it. We're going to go into exactly why this costs £140,000 and why this is actually quite an exciting car. So, this then was actually the first car to come from Volvo's luxurious arm Polestar, followed up by, as I said, the Polestar Two. This is likely to be the most expensive car the firm has ever built and think of it as kind of a flag bearer, a kind of a concept prover and something just to show the world what this firm can do. Now I mentioned the price already, it's £139,000. A lot of you be wondering what on earth is going on, why is it so expensive and who on earth is this car aimed at? On paper it is pitched against the Bentley Continental GT, the BMW 8 Series and the Mercedes S-Class Coupe. However, this car offered something completely different. Yes, it's got 600 odd brake horsepower, but the way it delivers it and what this actually represents as a package is completely, completely different. This will be for more of a thinking person than those other cars. Not to mention exclusivity wise, because only 1,500 of these will be built worldwide. 650 odd of those will be going to China. And at that price point, it does actually pitch it against the lower rungs of Aston Martin 2 and obviously the McLaren GT, not that anyone bought one of those brand new anyway. Price and power aside, that is where the comparisons stop and where things start to get a little more interesting. First things first, it actually sends more power to the front wheels than the rear wheels and we'll get into how it delivers the power and the various motors operating the power and where they all go and why. But also the suspension is completely different as well. This has actually got manually adjustable dampers. Again, we will go into that. There's also some trick bits around it, including some stuff produced by the company that also produces stuff for the McLaren P1. So there's some very interesting 
interesting kit on this car. So is it a racing car? No. Is it a GT? Yes, sort of. It's actually based on the Volvo's S90 platform, however they've chopped a bit out of the wheelbase and done various tweaks. It's also got a predominantly carbon shell and body, which is again unique for this point in the market. And Polestar make no secret of that. You're telling everyone on the side here, cool door handles, and also when you get in, you are also reminded here as well. Under the bonnet then, let's come around the front, actually sits a two litre petrol engine. Let's get this up. Actually sits a two litre petrol engine that is borrowed from the XC90 delivering just over 300 brake horsepower. And for some reason, the American variant of this car delivers 328 brake horsepower. Um, I don't know why that is, uh, but if you're in America, you get more power from your petrol engine. It's also helped by a 68 brake horsepower electric motor from the crankshaft, which uh, fills in the kind of uh, torque between gear changes and it's basically a little helper. And also, you've got two electric motors that power the back wheels as well, producing another 230 odd brake horsepower, meaning you have got instant torque there as well. So 230 odd brake horsepower from electric motors at the back. You've got 300 odd brake horsepower from a turbocharged and supercharged petrol engine at the front and you've also got a small um, 68 brake horsepower electric motor um, at the crankshaft as well. All in all, you've got around 600 brake horsepower all being delivered in various guises, turbo, supercharged, electric and traditional petrol aspiration. Trick bits on here then, I mentioned earlier there's a company that makes stuff for the McLaren P1. The company that actually makes these brakes, Akebono I think you call them, actually make the brakes on the McLaren P1 and they are present here on the Polestar 1. You've got gold calipers there and gold calipers here on the back as well. And you'll know from my Polestar 2 review, that I'm exceptionally keen on these gold calipers. These are actually to match the Olin's dampers, which I mentioned earlier, the manually adjustable dampers, which you can actually adjust 22 clicks wise. That means, and we'll go into that when we're driving around, you can soften off the front completely and you can actually tighten up the back for whatever reason you want to do that but you can it's 22 clicks of adjustment for each one the front you've got to get in there and adjust it um i don't know where you do it actually you can't do it from inside the car though you've actually got to go and fiddle around and get your hands dirty at the front and at the back which begs the question why would you want to do that in a gt not many people i know that own an s-class coupe or a bentley continental gt want to get their hands dirty and start fiddling around with dampers well that's just polestar saying we can do this olin's dampers are exceptionally expensive they're exceptionally tricky pieces of kit they actually provide obviously the dampers on the uh, Polestar racing cars and across many many racing teams as well it's just a point of difference and something really really cool and should you have any particular ride settings that you want you can do that let's get this closed up then I think we need to go for a little drive and that's carbon fiber that's actually really really nice all in all it's an interesting story so far there we go and you do have external carbon fibre as well. This whole front splitter there is carbon. You've obviously got your parking sensors and whatnot and your integrated camera there. Styling wise, it's a good news story, I think. This does get a lot of looks. It's got a lot of presence and it's not immediately obvious what it is. Another cool thing I like about this car as well, it's actually got active aero at the back. So let's get that wing up. Let's have a little look, see how we do this. We'll get onto the interior in a second. Little turn there, get the ignition on. Running through all the checks. There you go, lovely stuff. I actually got this little button here, which I believe makes the wing go up. Let's go and check, see whether it's done it. There we go, you got your little wing up there. Oik mode enabled. But this, I believe, will go up at speed, and you've also got a manual override, which I've just showed you. Again, not something you'd expect to see on an executive coupe like this. Coming back inside here then, let's have a little look at the interior, because it is very, very Swedish in here. You've got the sporty steering wheel in front of you, not overfaced with buttons, it must be said. You've got this colour screen behind there, which gives you all the functions, all your range, speed, whatever it is you need. And you've got this centre console here with the screen 
that has Google-based uh, navigations and options here as well. You've got your usual kind of Android Auto, whatever it is, your Bluetooth, blah, 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 and actually inbuilt Spotify apps as well and Google connectivity there. So you can actually just search wherever you are and it'll tell you uh, all sorts of stuff. And as with the Polestar 2, you can actually talk to it and say, uh, I'm not gonna bother actually, I was just about to uh, summon Google, but I'm not gonna do it. Um, but yes, very, very good, all works very well. Apparently there have been glitches on the Polestar 2, um, but at this point in time, I really don't care. I'm sure that's being sorted. If not, it has been already. You've got carbon fiber all around the car. And one of my favorite features about the interior of this car is Bowers and Wilkins Hi-Fi. So you've got speakers here. You've got that enormous speaker there. This is all a standard, by the way, in the Polestar 1. And at the back, you've got those speakers, which kind of like little tubes, sort of speedster-esque tubes behind the rear seat. Really, really nicely done. You've only got two seats in the back there, and headroom isn't amazing, but it's just about passable. Above your head here, you have this massive glass panoramic roof, which actually cuts out 95% of UV. That's fact of the day. That is as standard as well in the Polestar 1. It is very Volvo in here, but that's no bad thing. You've got your drive mode down here, and this is your start-stop. One click to the right to turn it on, one click to the right to turn it off. Lovely stuff. And what you don't get in the Polestar 2 is this huge piece of kind of sapphire, I believe, which is the gear stick, which you obviously select the gear with. It's a gear stick, Tom, obviously. Your seats are nice and buckety, and you do get the customary uh, yellowy gold seat belts to match your Olin's dampers and your valve caps on the outside that you actually have to spec optionally on the Polestar 2 as part of the performance package. These come as standard in the Polestar 1, and you'll see behind there, that is a green screen I was using to take some shots of the dog for my new business, Hype Pooch, recently. So let's go for a little drive then. Let's take it around town and we'll see how this gets on as a town car, as a cruiser, and see what it's all about once we get moving. Let's get moving then, let's get moving. And you may well be wondering at this point what is on my wrist. I've actually got the Aventi A10 Tourbillon with this brand new burnt titanium case. This is brand, brand spanking new. I don't think they've really been seen yet, um, but yeah, it's perfect for petrol heads with a burnt titanium case uh, akin to that of uh, an exhaust or uh, thereabouts. So obviously you've got skeletonized movement and Tourbillon. This is actually a production model now. The previous Aventi A10s you've seen have been prototype models and there's loads of cool, really nice finishing that they've put into this production model. Go and check them out on the Aventi website anyway. That's for those wondering what is on my wrist. And there's gonna be loads of stuff coming with Aventi. They've been very busy bees, so do stay tuned for more with myself and Aventi coming very soon. However, for now, let's get moving. We're off, we're off. So immediately when you turn it on, I must confess actually, this is literally just run out of battery. However, that's no big beef in this. Because it's a hybrid, you can just run it on petrol as normal. So we're literally just running on some residual electric right now to get going. And I think the petrol engines just cut in just there. So Polestar claim that you'll get about 90 miles on the electric motor before you need to charge it. And on a fast charge, that'll actually fully charge in 40 minutes which is pretty impressive. Sound from the two litre petrol engine. It's not exactly aggressive, it's not exactly AMG like, but then again, it is a two litre, but it is more impressive than I thought it would be. It does sound quite good. You do get a reassuring uh, rumble from it, especially in high revs. Um, so actually, I thought it'd be pretty pathetic because the two litre petrol engine in my Range Rover that's supported by an electric motor sounds horrendous, but this actually sounds pretty decent. You do get a bit of supercharger wine in there as well. Around town then, pulling out of junctions, um, maneuvering in tight spaces. It's good news. It's good news. It doesn't feel particularly cumbersome. The steering is very light at low speeds. He says, let's try not to crash. And you could foreseeably live with this on a daily basis quite happily. It's very, very comfortable. You may though be wondering what on earth I'm doing sat over here. Usually I'm over there if I'm driving a UK car. These only come in left-hand drive, which I suspect will probably only be an issue uh, for the UK market. These aren't going to be sold worldwide. There's only specific markets this is gonna to come to. And I believe the UK is probably if not the only market it's coming to where right-hand drive needs to be a thing. So Polestar haven't bothered making it in right-hand drive. It only comes in left-hand drive. Bit of a pain in the UK. You're sat over next to the curb as opposed to the middle of the road where you feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, but you get used to it, I guess. You get used to it. 
You do have different driving modes then. You can swivel this little drive mode thing in the middle here and you get uh, all wheel drive mode, which is I guess good if you're in somewhere snowy or icy or it gets cold in the UK. You've got power mode, which is this most sporty and aggressive mode, which obviously the uh, electric power uh, gets used up very, very quickly. Uh, and you've got hybrid as well. I tend to just use it in hybrid. It's been in hybrid most of the time I've had it. And I think that's the best balance. The car will just choose when to give you electric and when not to. And as I say at the moment, I'm literally just on petrol. There is no electric anymore. I've rinsed the whole lot. You can just hear it there rumbling along in the background. Road noise is minimal and there's no creaks or rattles from the cabin as you would expect from a high quality Swedish manufacturer like Volvo who are behind this car. But the car is actually produced in China and that is one of the reasons why 650 odd units are going to China. Now that is no bad thing. The Chinese know how to make things so I'm not actually put off by that. Driving around then, the dampers do feel very clever. You don't get any real body roll. The steering feels very direct, but it deals with bumps very, very well. <clears throat> you are aware of the fact this has got an extremely clever suspension. It wafts almost with a kind of a cloud-like nature of a Bentley, but it also is extraordinarily tight and sporty feeling when you want it to. Again, this is this is kind of a space where no car really operates. They either do one or the other. They're either kind of race car-like or they waft about. They don't usually do both. And that's pretty much down to the combination of the dampers, the very, very clever dampers, which are bored on about, and also the carbon in the construction of this car. I am hugely impressed. Would you track this? No, it's 2.3 tons, so you probably wouldn't. Um, but those brakes make light work of the mass as well. So between the dampers, the brakes, and the kind of carbon uh, construction of this car, it does feel a lot different to what you would expect from a huge uh, three-door, 2.3-ton um, Grand Tourer, effectively. And as I was saying before, it does get a lot of attention. People are interested in this. It doesn't get negative attention. People just want to have a chat about it. They want to ask what it is. It's got a lot of road presence, and I think at, not at the expense of looking like a Wally. It's a very interesting choice. I must admit, it's taken me a while to actually get my head around this car and actually get it. And I'm not sure I still do fully get this car and not in a bad way. I just think it's operating in such a new uh, area. It's managed to almost forge its own niche in the market. I think it's clever. I think it's interesting. I think Polestar have done something um, slightly out of the box thinking. And it's cool. Whilst all manufacturers are making basically the same thing, this is something a little bit different. 0 to 60, as you'd expect, is pretty rapid. It's about four seconds, uh, which is completely ludicrous for a car of this size and this weight. However, it doesn't feel out of control. Some cars, they've got kind of 600 or brake horsepower. They're inordinately heavy, they're inordinately large, and they do feel out of control when you stamp your foot down. This doesn't. It feels very composed, and it feels like it should be doing those speeds, which I guess is a plus. Should you buy one? To be fair, I would respect you if you did. I would rate you if you did. You never see these around, ever. You literally never ever see these around, so it would be cool. It's really, really cool. If you want matte paint, it's about five grand, but it does come pretty well optioned from standard. Everything you see in here is pretty much standard from the hi-fi to the roof, as I've said. You only get two color options, I believe, on the interior. You can go for this black, or I think you can get like a beige as well. Personally, I'd go black, um, but I think you've got about five color options as well on the outside, paint-wise. What don't I like? Time to be negative. The boot is not huge. The boot's not huge at all. Um, it does have some funky wiring in it, though, which I actually really like. You open it, it looks like uh, something from Back to the Future. Um, and I also don't like this piano black finish here around the um, the gear stick and around the, kind of the start-stop and the drive mode. I don't like piano black um, polished finishing in fact it, do, it does annoy me it picks up fingerprints it picks up swirls um, all in all I don't like that and I don't think that's befitting to this car I don't think it belongs here I think it needs a nicer finish I'm not sure if you can option that differently by all means do go and play around with the configurator but everything else in here is really nicely finished everything that looks like metal is metal uh, the carbon fiber the weave is unbelievable and it's a really nice satin effect so um, that's the only gripe I've probably got that and maybe the headroom in the back, it's not brilliant. You've got this cross bridge here, um, which can interfere if you've got kind of passengers with a rather lanky torso. Other than that, not really. Price, again, it's a lot. 
it is a lot of money. You do benefit, I think, from the kind of benefit in coin tax and whatever for your company cars, um, for it being a hybrid and the emissions being really low. Um, but you don't get free congestion charge in London. You don't get all the benefits you'd get from a full EV. However, you don't get the negatives of a full EV either. You don't have to mess around with uh, charging points if you don't want to. You can just run it around on petrol. Um, I've been running this around now all day just on petrol and it's just a normal car. It's still quick. It is still quick. You do still get some uh, residual electric in there. I think there's still probably some uh, residual electric that is um, regenerated whilst driving around, which will help the electric motor on the crankshaft. Um, and some of the, the, the electric motors at the back will still get some as well. So it's not completely bereft. It's not completely, completely petrol. Um, there is still some electricity that's been regenerated and being kept uh, in there. I believe you can feel it and it's still in kind of feels like EV mode when driving around even when the battery's empty so it's it's good from that perspective and I've enjoyed it it's not something I would buy I don't buy into the kind of a two-door um, Grand Tour S63 M8 end of the market anyway I've never bought a car like that um, and I don't think it's time for me to buy a car like that either I either like a sports car or I like an SUV but I'm a bit odd I know it's a really popular end of the market Oh, goodness me. Go back. Go back. Ugh. Ugh. London. You see in reverse there? It's fully electric. There we go. Apologies. Just filming a video. Blooming Audi drivers. Ugh. Try not to take the side off this car. I don't think Polestar would be particularly happy with me. I think this is pretty much the only one on their press fleet as well. Um, I feel really lucky to be able to have driven something so special and so neat. I've spoken to a few other journos that have driven this and most of them admit it, they didn't really get it straight away and they're still not 100% sure they get it, but that's in a good way. It's not often you get in a car and it kind of... Uh, bends your brain a little bit and you kind of can't really place your finger on it it's not a car like the maybe like the audi rs q3 where you think i don't get it what's the point this is actually slightly different to that it's it's more of a i see what they've done here interesting which is good good on polestar Anyway, before my windows steam up anymore, because I can't turn the aircon on uh, because of the GoPro, I'm going to disappear. Thank you very much for watching. Do subscribe. Give it a thumbs up. Let me know what you think of this little uh, real world review. And I'll see you all very soon. Ciao now.